Today I want us to take a few minutes and reflect some more upon this significant passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 15. It is one of the greatest, not the greatest statements on the resurrection of Jesus Christ in all of Scripture. Because we're reading from the Word of God, I know you've gotten up and down some, but because we're reading from the Word of God, this reading of the passage at hand, I'm going to ask you to stand with me one. Follow along as I read 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11. Paul says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I'm the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Now, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is in me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, so you believed. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And may the conjunction of celebrating the Lord's Supper to them, contemplating the resurrection of Christ, strengthen us. Renew us, change us, challenge us, go forth, be the people. Shepherds went with haste, told about the baby they did. The disciples with haste, told about an empty tomb. That's our message, our mission. God help us to fulfill it. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, this doctrinal passage on the doctrine of the resurrection is the high watermark in all of Scripture. All the Old Testament pointed toward the suffering, victorious conquering, victorious conquering of the Messiah. Most Jews granted victory. Most Jews would embrace that when Messiah came, he would put the enemies of Israel under his heel. They didn't understand, nor did most embrace the idea that, that would, the path to get there would be a path through suffering. So the victory not a military victory. It is a victory facing, enduring, absorbing, conquering our most lethal enemies. Sin. Sin's not always obvious. Sometimes it's subtle. Death. Death is obvious. We know when someone nearby has Expired. We've been in proximity to that in recent days. Vera's dad and now Judy Old's husband. Death is obvious. Hell is a reality. Many people reject the idea of it. The grave. How many times? Have we walked the grave? Place into the ground the remains of someone we loved, someone we knew. Jesus 
in his death and his resurrection. Conquered sin and death, hell, and the grave. I told you last or two weeks ago that when we begin to open up this passage, that you see in it five uh, witnesses, if you please, to the resurrection. The testimony of the church, first of all, in verses 1 and 2. The testimony of the scriptures in verses 3 and 4. The testimony of the eyewitnesses in verses 5 to 7. The testimony of the apostle Paul himself, verses 8 to 10. And the testimony of the, of the message given in the message, verse 11. We looked last time at, the, at this testimony of the church, verses 1 and 2. He says, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you. He says, you received it. You're being saved by it. We talked about the, that process, that, that instantaneous moment when you're saved, that process as you continue to be saved on the way to being saved finally saved in glory. With that warning, that caveat, if you hold fast. You see, I hope you've noticed by now in your study through the New Testament that there was, there was throughout the New Testament era the temptation for those who had, had made a radical departure from their culture, whether they were Jews making a radical departure from Judaism to embrace the carpenter from Nazareth, whom Judaism had officially labeled as a blasphemer, or whether it was the radical departure from the Gentile cultures, primarily dominated by Roman influence. Wherever you were coming from to come to Christ, you were making a, a radical departure. And the temptation was, in the face of difficulty, to turn back. Apostle Paul has seen this already in his, in his ministry. By which you're being saved if you hold fast to the word I preach to you. And then here's the warning. It's painful to read it because as, when I read it, I have images of people in my mind, names that come to my mind of people who, who at one point in their lives, as Bunyan describes in, in, in Pilgrim's Progress when they're in that in the interpreter's house, and they're in the room with the man in the iron cage. He once was a fair, flourishing believer. You and I know people who once were like that. Maybe family. Maybe neighbors. Maybe friends. Maybe, maybe dear friends that you joined together in worship. Unless you believed in vain, he said. We looked at that last time. Today I want us to turn our thoughts. We think about the, how Christianity sets itself apart. Read a couple of quotes to you here. 2,000 years since this event, this resurrection, there's been what you would call subjective evidence of the reality of the resurrection, lives transformed. Think about it. The church has survived skepticism from outside and inside. It has survived persecution. In fact, I would suggest it thrives persecution. It has survived heresy from inside, unfaithfulness, disobedience, the resurrection has been called a hoax, a fabrication. People have said he swooned. As we read in, our in the responsive, in the, in the text we were reading, that, that they took the body, the disciples took the body and hid it. Yet the church is alive. The vitality of Christianity is undeniable. Writer, last name is Major, 
who said, had the crucifixion of Jesus ended his disciples' experience of him, it is hard to see how the Christian church could have come into existence. That church was founded on faith in the Messiahship of Jesus. A crucified Messiah was no Messiah at all. He was one rejected by Judaism and accursed of God. It was the resurrection of Jesus, as Paul declares in Romans 1.4, that proclaimed him to be the Son of God with power. Some of you will be familiar with Kenneth Scott Latterette, who, who wrote uh, The History of the Expansion of Christianity. He said this, It was the conviction of the resurrection of Jesus which lifted his followers out of the despair into which his death had cast them and which led to the perpetuation of the movement by him. But for their profound belief that the crucified had risen from the dead and they had seen him and talked with him, the death of Jesus and even Jesus himself, listen to this, would probably been all but forgotten had he not risen from the dead. Follower of Buddha writes, when Buddha died, it was with that utter passing away in which nothing whatever remains. Muhammad died at Medina, June 8, 632. At the age of 61, his tomb there is visited yearly by tens of thousands of Muslims. But they come to mourn his death, not to celebrate his resurrection. And it's the church of Jesus Christ and only the church of Jesus Christ that not just on Easter Sunday, but at every gathering, particularly the Lord's Day gatherings on the first day of the week, celebrates the victory of our Lord over death and the grave. I want us to take a few minutes to look at the testimony scriptures, verses 3 and 4. It says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. And we went over this a couple of weeks ago, but I want to, I want to keep this at our forefront. While the taste of the wafer and the taste of the juice is still with us. It's of first importance. Brothers and sisters, I want to say parenthetically, we need to be careful that we don't make things that are not of first importance the most important. What we rally around is the gospel. Chiefly, the gospel. So the most important thing, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. When you go back and read the Scriptures, every prophetic reference, even as far back as in Genesis, when our first parents were rebuked and then encouraged in the aftermath of their sin, that the seed of a woman, she would have a child, which meant to Adam they were not going to die right there on the spot the consequence of their sin because he named her Eve at that point. She shall be mother of all the living. The seed of the woman, the child of the woman would come and the serpent who had beguiled them and dragged them into sin, that the seed of that serpent would bruise the heel. In the symbolism there, the bruising of the heel seems to us like a small wound, but, but a serpent bite on the heel would render the victim incapable. The poison would kill them. It's a mortal blow. But the picture went on that the child of the woman who would be wounded mortally by the serpent bite would take his heel and crush the head of the serpent. In other words, would, would render powerless 
null, void, ineffectual. What the serpent is attempting to do in his bite. When you see that picture in Genesis, you're not far into the Bible. And there it is, the gospel. There. And when you follow it through into Exodus, we talked about around the Lord's table, Passover, the gospel is there. When you go into Leviticus, all the instruction about sacrifice and, and priestliness, foreshadowing the gospel, and the numbering in the book of Numbers, and where that's applauded and where that's rebuked, symbolic that our Savior would come with a definite number of the human race mind. Deuteronomy, the, the second giving of the law, that's what it means. The fleshing out of the law, the, the first giving of the law shattered, written on tablets of stone and shattered by the people before Moses could get among them and broken by Moses in frustration. But this time, the second giving of the law, symbolizing that the law would come walking. The law embodied. We talked a couple weeks ago about the, the codification or putting in code the law versus the embodiment of the law. In Jesus. Wherever you go in the Scriptures, the gospel is being unfolded. The whole focus of the Old Testament. And so he died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, with the Old Testament. And he was buried. He, he actually died. He gave up the ghost cross. He breathed his last on the cross. They took him and buried him as we sang in a tomb that he only borrowed for three days. I love a sermon I heard years ago by an African-American pastor who said he, he, he didn't need a grave of his own. He could borrow one. He wasn't going to be using it very long. Only needed it for three days. He was buried. And he rose on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, the promises. He would come alive. Listen real quickly as we close this morning. Luke 24, 25 to 27. This is on the road to Emmaus. Jesus comes up beside two disciples. They're grieving. Are you the only one who doesn't know what happened? Our rabbi, crucify. He says to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. He's not talking about the death there. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses, the first five books of the Bible, and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Matthew 12, 39 and 40, the unbelieving Jews wanted a sign of his Messiahship. He said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You want a sign? You want a sign? Kill me. And I'm coming back to life three days later. You will have. That's the only sign you get. I don't do miracles. I'm not your rabbinic magician. Here's the sign. I'll be buried. I'll be raised. At Pentecost, Peter quoted from Psalm 15 in Acts chapter 2, verses 25 to 31. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. 
Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You've made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Peter says, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, to the abode of the dead, nor did his flesh see corruption. He wasn't there long enough to begin period. In Acts 26, 22, 23. To this day, I've had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. This is Paul before King Agrippa. That the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people, that is Jews, and to the Gentiles. Paul didn't get that studying in the school of Gamaliel. He got that in the Arabian desert when the Holy Spirit took him and gave him theological education that conformed to the Spirit. Jesus, Peter, Paul quoted or referred to many passages in the Old Testament about death, burial, and resurrection. So do we today. We celebrate the Lord's Supper not because we mourn the death of Jesus. We celebrate the Lord's Supper because it is symbolizing his death, but we celebrate it with joy because he, he didn't stay dead. He rose. He rose. The resurrected king. The question I have to ask myself when I look at life's challenges that are before me, and I ask you this as well, is the resurrected king resurrecting you daily? The one who brought you from death to life. Is he giving you life as you move through life's challenges and trials? Jesus said, in this world, you will be squeezed. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So when the one who has overcome sin and death and hell and the grave says, be of good cheer, because I've overcome them all, then nothing, no one, no circumstance, no providence, And overcome us. We're living by grace through faith in the overcomer, Jesus Christ. Oh, brothers and sisters, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. The gospel, first importance. Everything else, everything else. Shadow over it. Not because it's not known, but because the gospel beams so brilliantly in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ that the only thing, only way you understand anything else in reality, in the Word, is through his life, death, burial, and resurrection. Paul wanted them to know. That's what I need to know. You need to know that. Go from this place today. May the gospel be the power of God in your life, salvation, in your circumstances under salvation. May the gospel transform every part of your being. And may we have the confidence it's the gospel, and only the gospel, that can transform others, transform culture. Pray. Dear Holy Father, we bow before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and grateful for this day, grateful we can be back together. Lord, sweet thing to be with the people of God. Bless our time we've been together. Take the truth that we've spoken and read and sung and just penetrate our minds with it. Cause it to fill the lenses of our lives. Grip our hearts so that whatever, whatever the con condition, if our hearts are sad today, may the gospel make us glad. If our hearts are, are weary today, may the gospel give us strength. If our hearts are rebellious today, may the gospel break that rebellion and produce 
obedience to you. We're thankful for Jesus Christ. Thankful for the gospel. It tells us about him. Thankful that you loved us. You sent somebody to tell us the gospel. May we never forget that and, and offer ourselves today. We want to be that somebody in somebody else's life. Tell them the good news of Jesus. We ask it in his name and for his sake. Amen. Let's stand and sing.